Welcome, everybody. We are pleased to be presenting our first live streamed artist talk and exhibit walkthrough through Lux Art Institute. Our entire Lux team has been working tirelessly over the last two weeks to convert this usually physical reception into a digital experience. So I want to give them all a big thank you. In this room, we have two of our staff members, and we have a ridiculous amount of hand sanitizer and disinfectant wipes. We are all at least six feet away from each other. We are proud to be able to provide Lux programming in this time of uncertainty in our world. This is also a great time to reflect on humanity's effect on the environment. In the next two months, we'll be presenting work not only by Michelle Montjoy, but also by Khan and Selesnik artists who address humanity's impact on the environment and who discover the beauty in the catastrophic. Tonight's presentation is made possible with your support and that of the city of Encinitas, and the music you heard is from the Art of Elan, presented here at Lux Art Institute, Topo Chico, and Procopio Law Firm. Attorneys and staff at all of Procopio's locations remain hard at work by telecommuting and engaging with clients via phone and teleconference. The firm is also making available to the public a variety of free COVID-19 related resources on its website at a dedicated page, procopio.com slash COVID-19. Those resources include articles and webinars on a variety of topics, such as how employers can best take care of their employees and ensure operations, what clauses businesses may be able to use in their insurance policies to help cover losses and more. As an arts institution currently closed to the public, we also need your continued support. Please contribute to Lux Art Institute today with a donation in any size, whatever, whether that's $5 or $20. Your support helps keep these programs active. You can do so by calling 760-436-6611. Again, that's 760-436-6611 or you can send a gift via Venmo. Our username on Venmo is lux-art. That's L-U-X hyphen A-R-T. Michelle Montjoy's immersive installation spread to take over, overtake the space, offering an absurd and surreal look at society's relationship to the environment. Montjoy empowers this conversation through the use of recycled t-shirts, that she rips up and ties together to make immense balls of yarn. These textiles are crocheted, transforming the pieces into interactive structures. The dichotomy of the natural world is being depicted through the use of recycled material, and it brings awareness to the viewer's own consumptive impact, as well as humanity's collective existence on the environment. Michelle has recently shown at the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, the San Diego International Airport, the Oceanside Museum of Art, and Athenaeum Music and Arts Library in La Jolla, all San Diego-based organizations for those joining us from afar, as well as numerous other locations throughout San Diego, New Mexico, and Washington State. In 2007, she was nominated for the San Diego Art Prize and received grants from the California Arts Council and the San Diego Foundation's Creative Catalyst Grant. We are pleased to present Michelle and her work at Lux Art Institute. I'm now going to pass the mic over to Michelle. Hey, here we are. <sighs> well, I'm in Oceanside at my kitchen table. Here it is. Yay. And I want to just thank you all for joining us. I hope you all are well and feeling good and healthy and staying home and being cozy and all that good stuff. So, um, Pardon me for any technological clunkiness. I'm sure this is my first time at this, so we're gonna see how it goes. But um, anyway, I wish I could see all your faces. Um, I'm gonna do a quick uh, PowerPoint deal. I'm gonna talk a little about what I've done before, and then I really wanna get into the process of this particular project um, and all that has gone on with this. So if I can do this, uh, lovely thing that I'm trying for. I'll get started on my talk. Okay, share screen. Here we go from beginning. All right, I hope this is working. Here we go. All right. Okay. Ah, all right. 
So the title of this exhibition, this installation is Borrow Pit. Um, most of you probably know me from these knitted installations that I've done. Um, I've been doing these since 2015. This was my first one. This is at the Athenaeum in La Jolla. And um, yeah, got started with that one. Uh, this is at Art Produce, another space that's dear to my heart. And in this one, I brought the looms in. I wonder if you can see my pointer. That's how I'm talking about it. Um, and people were allowed to sit uh, and knit with me in this. It was kind of the beginning of my interactive kind of world. Um, the title of this was So Many Hours in the Day. Um, over at Ship in the Woods in Escondido for their Flat Earth show, I made blue ones out of t-shirts and I don't dye them. I just get them all um, and source them from mostly my DAV, a lot of my friends, the DAV is the thrift store and it's a few blocks away from me, um, my friends and things like that. For this one, we hung them up in the trees and invited people to get inside. I worked with a sound artist, Greg Smaller, and I was just amazed because folks just climbed right in and danced around and the rest of the day I could tell who was in them because there was blue lint all over them. Um, in 20, I got to get my years straight. In 2017, I did um, the project with the Creative Catalyst grant called River. I worked with the Oceanside Museum of Art and there I really expanded the social component of my work, my practice. I went around to a thousand or 30 different places in North County and engaged over a thousand people. We worked on this project that ended up becoming a large installation in the um, museum there. Um, then later that year, I did another project. This is with uh, Domestic Action, it was called, with Art Produce. We took over the gallery and put in all kinds of people were knitting, you can see back there doing all that. We were finger crocheting. It was just a lovely social piece in there. This is from 2018 and um, I don't re-knit every single time. So I took some of the things from the museum at Oceanside Show and put them in there and um, cut them and redid them and had Blue Feeny's help doing this. And we made this installation for the airport. And I uh, hope a lot of you got to see that. That was a lovely time there. Um, and then in fall of 2018, this is my piece as the part of the group show, Being Here With You. And it was at Museum of Contemporary Art San Diego. So there's that. And then you can look up at it like that. I'm really big on looking up, changing everybody's directions. Yeah. Um, okay, I know. Um, so, sorry, my husband's communicating with me here too. Anyway, um, so another project that's dear to my heart is the To Do Project. I work with um, Siobhan Arnold and Anna O'Kane right there. We did two big projects and a bunch of pop-ups. One was at the 1805 Gallery in Little Italy, and then this is at Museum of Contemporary Art. We did it just this last summer. Um, we invited 30 artists, friends of ours, to share what they know how to do and they offered free workshops, brought in all kinds of the public to do everything from this, which was uh, making, oh, this was the infusions. Um, we made salsa and pasta, we learned how to, and we also mended everybody's clothes. Um, so that, that's another big project that I've worked on. I'm also known for my um, embroidery work. Uh, this is a piece that I threw in because it probably, I made it in 2017, but it probably has a lot to do with today for me. Um, and then I'm in a show at this moment that many of you might have seen if you got there early. Um, that's at the Cannon Gallery with Bhavna and Irma, uh, two lovely women, friends of mine. And we hopefully this will you'll see this or we'll figure out how to see this or you might have made it to the opening. But that is called Edges Freed. All right. So starting this project last November, Andrew and Husha asked me to, um, offered me a chance to have this show. And we talked about environmentalism. We talked about it being Earth Day month. Uh, we talked about things that are dear to my heart and the connections of humans and nature. And also about recycling and about, you know, the use of things. 
So what happens at the beginning of these projects is you, you really just do this giant investigation, or I do. So I'm, I'm sharing a lot of my process in this. So first thing I did was just take a long walk around the Lux grounds. And I'm also a big hiker and I walk all sorts of places, take pictures and let a lot of these inform my forms and shapes of that I work on. There's a giant saguaro. Um, at the time, I happened to be reading this book too, which really ended up um, influencing this project, this piece. Um, the Overstory by Richard Powers, if you haven't read it, it's phenomenal. Um, it's, it's a really dense book, but it speaks beautifully about uh, the human and nature connection and the, the equality of humanity and nature. And it really um, was so resonant with me. Um, and I really decided to kind of take off with what I was reading. Here was a beautiful picture from New Mexico of two trees that are, have grown together. So um, the other things that I was kind of grabbing around was uh, the Marie Kondo craze that was happening. I've, you know, I'm, I'm still in this big time and I'm grabbing all these influences. Everybody's getting rid of their clothes, but we all know that, you know, making, using clothes, using them all the time, the fast fashion thing was really a terrible um, problem in the environment with us. And so um, I thought, you know, we're throwing away all these clothes, but then is it just to, you know, buy new ones? So that also was in my mind. And um, in case you're wondering, these are, <laughs> this is just a screenshot of all the notes that I write myself, like just, you know, writing, 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 writing. And so after that is when you really start editing and you really start cleaning things up. And the things that really stuck with me were the overstory, the Marie Kondo thing, um, how we're all connected. And um, I thought a lot about that Mary Oliver line in Wild Geese where she says um, the soft, I gotta find it, it's the soft animal of your body. So my intention with this is more putting together the human forms and the natural forms, the tree forms and our body. And I sketched out these ideas threw them back at Andrew and Husha, they said, go for it. Um, luckily, I had a residency that was in Wyoming in January because the time is getting really short now and you can see I was taking on a little bit there. Uh, so I drove myself out to Wyoming with all sorts of bins of my friends' clothes, um, used clothes they had given me, my friends and family, Shout out to my book group, especially, who gave me a bunch of their clothes. Um, this is at Brush Creek Ranch. It's at a small little town called Saratoga, Wyoming. And I just had to share with you, this is the grocery store. I mean, I was not in California anymore. So um, it was a beautiful, gorgeous cabin type uh, studio that I got for about three weeks. And they fed me wonderfully. And I took hikes every day. And I started also really experiencing a landscape um, that I was not familiar with. And, you know, when you travel, you know that you, you just have this heightened sense of looking. And it's really a beautiful way to connect when you're also working in your studio many hours a day. Um, so these are some of the sites, the lichen. Oh, my gosh, just absolutely beautiful out there. And so I would go out on walks and then I'd come back and make drawings and then I would work in the studio and you can kind of see a bit of my process here which is extremely messy but that's the way it works um lots of coffee uh yoga mats i got all that going um and what i was considering was that each one of these hanging forms was an embodiment of a person um this these were my friend beverly halsey's clothes and i used them thinking of her as i was working on them and, you know, kind of even let the form be dictated a bit by her personality also. So I kept moving on all of these. Oh, had some wonderful snowy, snowed in days, took more walks. The trees are just so different and interesting. Kept reading Richard Powers, did drawings of trees, worked on some more things like this. Oh. Icicles are just incredible. It's 
So I'm just going through and then I would drag my fellow residents in and say, oh, come try this out because my intent in this is for, for this to be a fully interactive installation. I thought about the people that are coming in and out of the Lux, the kids classes, the summer camps that we're or the spring break camps that we're going to be going on. And I just, you know, I really love to just um, break all the rules and say, this is art you can touch. There is an irony in that now, but hey, I was going for it. So a little bit more Wyoming and how those things were working. There's the studio getting a little bit more full. Dragged other residents in to try things out. They were all good sports. And this is what I had when I left there. So that was at the end of January that I got that much done. So I had to strap on my cables of the car because I got snowed in almost on the way out. Learned how to put cables on and came back home. So I'm back home. This is my studio here at home. And I'm also working on, you can see the Canon show back there. So I was really kind of killing it in there. I got a hold great regard for, I have an intern from Cal State San Marcos, Sarah Brick. She was just helping me incredibly during these past month or two. Um, that was my first time having an intern like that. It was really great. Um, and what was happening was spring. And so I'm taking walks, I walk the dog all the time, and I'm seeing these kinds of colors come out and these forms. Uh, there's some beautiful ceanothus, oh, chocolate lilies. If you haven't seen these, they're amazing. They're not very common and they're just beautiful. The wild cucumbers. And then I'm also going back and visiting Lux and I'm thinking about things. And then I've got to this wonderful chance to see Chacho and Gioni's work, which was so gorgeous and lush. And you can see if you didn't get a chance to see that show, my gosh, I mean, it was, it was amazing. So all these things are filtering through me as I'm sitting in my house and I knit and crochet. It's not just crochet. Sometimes I knit on looms. Sometimes I finger crochet. Sometimes I use knitting needles. I do all kinds of methods. Everything that I can do, I figure it out. So then it comes time for install. So this is just last Tuesday, as in Tuesday before Friday. And the world is already starting to shut down. And we were, you know, communicating a lot with Andrew and Husha and like, are we going to do this? Is this going to happen? Oh yeah, we can do this, you know. So Claudia was in there sanitizing everything and I pull up with my van and start working on this. And honestly, it was just amazing to get to have this time to just be thinking about my work and thinking about the art and thinking about the installation and trying to jump off, you know, the news cycle for a bit. So um, this, I had to show you the very unglamorous way that textile art gets transported. It's bins. It's, you know, just not very fancy, got to thank Costco for all those bins. And um, it was pretty much just, it was just me doing this. So up and down those ladders, my thighs were screaming by the next, last day. Um, there's a couple of shots of the bins as I'm going. There's Claudia having her long distancing there and we were shooting time-lapse photos. So um, you'll see those pretty soon. Um, we had them going on both cameras and I have to say my time with her was just amazing. Um, kind of yelling at each other across the room, keeping our distance. But So as I was up on the ladders, I took a lot of pictures. Um, these were my, you know, I thought would be the shot, the pictures that nobody, you know, got a chance to look at. But now this whole exhibition is stuff that you didn't get a chance to look at except on photos. So I'm very happy I took a lot of photos because at this point we weren't really sure we were all doing this, but thinking we were moving towards this. There's a shot of me doing the finger crocheting. Um, all the pieces came separately and then I knitted them all together. So I, almost everything is completely connected. Um, there's another shot from the ladder, working on getting all those up in the rafters. There's a shot from the kitchen as I'm moving along. And this is still Tuesday. Yeah, this is still Tuesday. There's a pair of shoes in there if you can't tell working on the lighting and shadows. I also brought in some pieces that I had done previously. This was one I did a little bit ago, but I thought, oh, this just was working. I kind of had A list and B list and C list of um, bins. And I, I definitely got to B and a little bit of C. Um, you know, it's site specific. You just, you're working on what you're working on and um, you never really know how things are gonna go. So uh, I did use quite a bit of it. 
there's another shot of the gallery space. And, you know, meanwhile, Lux is emptying out and there's this, you know, peaceful quality and also at the same time, you know, just seeing all those wheels not being used. Um, it's a little forlorn, I have to say, on top of it. It's starting to get to me. You know, these, these so I started hanging these pieces. They're all kind of in their own little space hanging from there. And that is the end of Tuesday now. So we're at the end of Tuesday. We come in Wednesday morning and I've brought these guys a salad and they look at me and say, oh, no, we got out of here. We thought they were going to get stuck for two weeks. Um, they were able to get home, which I don't know if you're on this, but I hope you are. And um, I'm so happy that you got home. Who cares? We ate the pie later. Um, but yeah, so they were great guys. And here's Andrew. I have to embarrass him. He even climbed in some of the pieces. What a great group this has been. I mean, we're going to talk about this for the rest of our lives, I'm sure. But yeah, when a director climbs into your work and takes selfies, that's pretty cool. And oh, we had a dog come visit. That definitely made my day too. I hope you all have pets because they're really nice to have right now. And there's Claudia. I'm up at the ladder. She's helping me out. I mean, love you, babe. You're the best. Uh, so as I'm working on this Wednesday, things are just, I'm just really am incorporating what's going on in the world. And I started to put some pieces kind of far away, more isolated. Um, you know, it has a little bit different feel. We adapt. You're, you're, I'm responding to the world the way we all are uh, on a day-to-day -day basis. And, and this installation changed with that. Um, and of course, here I am, I'm giving the, I'm sanitizing the thumb drive that I'm giving to Justin to put together the slideshow. I mean, I've never used so much Purell in my life. Um, Claudia was sanitizing every single pen, pencil, and marker. I mean, it's just amazing amount of our work. Um, this piece is dear to my heart too. This was in the Lux years ago. By the way, I used to teach there a long time ago. And we had a little show that Lisa Corona put together of all the teachers works. And this one was there. I ended up meeting um, Brian and Ryan who were there when we were working. And so uh, I had to throw this one in there. And, you know, I'm trying to like embody the, I know now nobody's going to be coming in here. So I'm bringing in even more of the human kinds of forms as I'm, as I'm installing. I'm wanting to, you know, have them be part of this. Um, I thought a lot about, you know, these little spaces that were meant for kids to climb in and kind of have a little den and hide in and, you know, just bringing all that in. Added little nests. This is a shot from the ladder. This is a um, piece, the white piece you were meant to put your hand into and the little red thing that's hanging down, you can shake and it makes noise. Let me get Andrew to do all this. This is well, this one I put on the way to the office so that folks could, as they were, they would hit it as they walked to the office and it would spin around. And then I'm growing almost through the building in a lot of ways too. There's a lot of root-like forms, a lot of tree-like forms, a lot of sweater forms, and things that are, you know, hopefully, you know, in between those things. So about now I started thinking a lot about these distances, you know, this six foot thing, 10 foot thing, now house to house kind of distance that we're embracing. So I, I added that to the work. I thought that was something to, you know, be thinking about right now. And then I decided to add all these little, um, let's see, house, house elves, <laughs> Harry Potter reference, or we could call them gargoyles. They maybe they, we could say that they're, um, yeah, keeping us safe, guarding us from the evil spirits. I believe that's what gargoyles are meant to do on medieval churches. So I've got them tucked up in little places like that. They were meant to be little surprises. Now I've given away all the surprise, you know, it was going to be one of those like, oh, let's see if we can find them. There they are watching over in this sweet little space. And these guys right here, which are really trying to dance, but you know, they're a little bit farther apart. Ah, oh, so here it is. This is Borrow Pit. You can see up on top, everything is connected. 
and all these individuals are hanging hanging down like that. Um, yeah, I I thought I, I wanted to close this talk with a, a quote that I pulled from the overstory um, because I thought it was just something nice to read. So the quote is, there's a Chinese saying, when is the best time to plant a tree? 20 years ago. The Chinese engineer smiles, good one. When is the next best time? Now. Ah, okay. The smile turns real. Until today, he has never planted anything. But now, that is the best of times. Is long and rewrites everything. So, now I'm going to try to exit this. I might need to call Andrew. Stop video. Oh, start video. Okay. Oh, shoot. Hey, Michelle. Yep, yeah, I just jumped off. There we go. All right. Well, thank you so much, Michelle. Uh, that was a great presentation. We're actually going to switch to a new view of the space, and we're going to do a little Q&A while we walk through the space. Kevin? Yes. I, I, I... So here we are. Give us just one second here. I lost me. Okay, hang on. Andrew? I need to. There we go, Michelle. You're okay. Are you seeing me? I don't see you, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, we are doing a live video of the exhibition in the gallery space right now. And we have some questions. Okay. And you can hear me, right? We can hear you great. Okay, good. So the first one comes from Christine. And it is what is one of the most memorable or surprising ways that someone interacted with your artwork? Oh. <laughs> Boy, there have been a lot of them. Um, I think when people end up going in together, that's always kind of interesting. Um, I would say the one that I remember, I remember the most is that um, when the green little guys that are at the end were at Art Produce. My friend's twins each got into one and they commented that this is a nice place to have a little cry. I liked that. Thanks, that's a great one. Uh, there's an, anonym, an anonymous attendee that says, thank you for this inspiring talk. How has creativity helped you during this time of social distancing? Oh, for sure. And I, I really hope that a lot of you are finding that way to just take a little step away. Um, our creativity gives us also a way to rethink things and maybe to jump out of, I don't know about the rest of you, but, you know, the anxiety can really be pretty intense right now. And if I can be present and I, I, like I said, putting this up allowed me to be present. It allowed me to be thinking just about that and not about everything else that was spinning around. Um, I think that's what creatives really have um, in our studio practice. And, uh, you know, and yogis do too and things like that. So I, I really think that's, um, that's, that's definitely been a blessing. And I hope everyone is drawing or you know, knitting or doing whatever it is that's making them feel good, too. Thanks, Michelle. I actually have another question for you uh, that comes from me. And I wanted to ask you more about your anthropomorphic forms. So I know you talked a lot about your relationship of your work to the environment. And you also talk about some of the objects as creatures. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you can talk a little bit more about the relationship between the environment and these creatures. Oh, okay. <laughs> wow, that's a good question. Um, in a lot of ways, it I visually take both. I take both forms and morph them together. I try to almost unthink while I'm working. 
but like I showed in the slideshows and all the, the natural forms and then all my friends, if I can put both of those thoughts in my brain at the same time while I'm working, I feel like that really informs the way things come out. Um, in my, my practice, I tend to back off if it starts getting too literal and I pull in if it starts getting too obtuse. So I kind of work both that way. Um, the creatures, I know, I came up with those and maybe because that's a word that really does work on both platforms, um, both in the natural world and in the human world. Have I answered your question? I'm not even sure if yeah, I- Yeah, you're yeah. answering the question. I think, okay. uh, you know, we have a larger ecosystem at play. And as we look through the gallery too, I'm noticing more and more that there's a really large ecosystem that you've built here. It's not just the plants or the animals or creatures, but it's a, a larger perspective on what our environment is and, and how that environment is not only created by the, the plants that we are uh, trying to save, but it's also kind of created through the materials that we've falsified, you know, looking at the fabrics that we've created from uh, from materials and giving it a new life. So it's almost like uh, all the plastic and the fabric that we've given the world have transformed themselves into this new ecosystem. It's mm -hmm. almost sort of like a, a tragic future, but you've turned it into a beautiful future. Thanks. Yeah. Gosh, you're so good with words. Um, yeah, I, I really wanted there to be this um, Kind of a reckoning in this piece too that it's it's whimsical but it also has a a gravity and a, a mutual accountability i think that's a, a term i kept thinking about too we're, we're all connected we're all in this together um and so yeah but you did a great job of talking about that good job andrew thanks i think <laughs> uh we have another question from christine it's very similar to that a little bit of an extension she says i noticed some pieces were on the floor how come those aren't connected to the rest of the pieces yeah i thought about that originally the intent was that was where a human would sit like little floor mats and then be able to touch the works um you know and and that would make the connection um now they are not serving that purpose, so they're almost more like drips, like the pieces have dripped out, um, is what I was thinking of in when I was placing them. But that's a great question and a great observation. We have another question from Jack. Uh, thank you for your work, he says. Can you describe your process of deconstructing the clothing? Oh, yeah. So... I got into this because when I did that very first installation at the Athenaeum, I had pitched it and not realized that there was no way I could afford the yarn. I thought I was going to do it in yarn. So I, I'd been a knitter for a while. And when I was turning my sculptures, I wanted to make sculptures. And so I was knitting them. So I started doing them in yarn. Well, then when I got to something that massive, I realized I could not afford to do that. And so I went on Google and said, what you know what can i use what's affordable way to you you know get some textile material and it literally on google it said this is how you make yarn out of t-shirts and it was just absolutely everything it you know because then i've got all these people's lives and stories and probably some of their dna from all the thrift store t-shirts along with um the you know the for the amount of material that I'm getting because it was like $20 for a bag of them. So it, for me, it served both purposes. And, you know, we as artists, we struggle with all the things that everybody struggles with is what do we, you know, we're using these new materials. We're, you know, using up, you know, products. And so it also really assuaged my guilt of, uh, you know, I'm using things that were going to be thrown away. So that's how it is. I, I'd love to show you how, um, but I accidentally took my video off. But it's if you Google making t-shirt yarn, you can find out how to do it. It might be something you want to do this week or this month. It's pretty handy. 
And we don't have it here in the space, but uh, Michelle also brought this really beautiful loom. She showed it in one of her pictures in her presentation. It's a really big loom, and she has mentioned that she'll be coming in. I don't know if that's going to be possible yeah. now uh, with all of the uh, all of the regulations that we have in California at the moment. But uh, there are definitely some great pictures of that on the internet too. If you look up Michelle's name, you can see the loom and, and that practice of creating. And I remember Michelle, when Husha, our associate curator and I came to your studio to first talk about your work, um, we all talked about the ideas and, and what we want to do for the exhibition, uh, all sitting around one of those looms and it became this very community based mm -hmm. uh, engagement. It wasn't just a, here's a loom, this is where I work, but rather how can we all work together and how can we all create together? Right. I, I have another question from Grace. Uh, she says, hi, Michelle, wonderful show and discussion. Thank you. Will you expand a bit on the Marie Kondo craze and the impact it has made? Oh, so um, I, I'm sure most of you have heard Marie Kondo is the woman who uh, wrote the book about uh, whether or not you're clothing sparks joy. And um, a lot of people were cleaning out their closets and, and putting them, you know, giving them to Goodwill and things like that. And the Goodwills were just getting overrun with, and the thrift stores overrun with clothing. And um, I, who at my massive thrift store shopper was, was noticing that that was going on. And a little bit of me was feeling like we were robbing Peter to pay Paul kind of deal where we were just, um, you know, pushing down the pike um, the problem. The problem is we wear too many clothes, we buy too many clothes, we you know, consume too much. And I didn't feel like that was really an honest uh, approach you know, to our consumerism. And so uh, you know, I, was, I, I also appreciate a clean closet, trust me, I you know, do that too. So I don't wanna be so sanctimonious about it, but I do, feel like this um, weight of this installation is about that heaviness of how many pieces of clothing are in this. I was venturing to guess that there are probably at least 2,000 pieces of clothing in this exhibition. Um, it was over 1,000 for just what was in the Athenaeum. So this is a lot larger. So um, if you think about 2,000 pieces of clothing, that, that's, you know, pretty significant. Thank you so much. We have another question from Brian. Uh, what is the significance of the title? I was hoping somebody would ask that. Um, so Barrow Pit, when I was in Wyoming, you know, how you, when you're working on a piece and you're just kind of, I have post-it notes all over trying to think of titles. Titles are always the hardest things for me. And um, when I'm in Wyoming, there was a writer there who was from Wyoming and we were driving into town and I said something about the ditch. And he said, no, we don't call it a ditch in Wyoming. We call it a borrow pit because what they do is they borrow the dirt and they build up the road. And I came back in my studio and I realized that's exactly what this is all about. It's, it's you know, we may think we're solving a problem, but we might be creating another one. Um, so that's, that's where borrow pit came from. Plus, I just think that is the coolest word for a ditch. Thank you. That's a, that's a great explanation. I really like also that you're borrowing and not just taking. Uh, you know, we, we also need to give back a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have a question from George. Uh, this is a larger question here. What is the main message behind this exhibit? Sum it up. Oh, oh no, yeah, Andrew, you have to do this. You know, this is so fresh and new at this point because it kind of got reworked in the light of it not being interactive. You know, originally this was about um, breaking through a lot of our expectations and our uh, mutual accountability um, in all of it. And that the, the playfulness of everybody touching it all and climbing into it was really, I was hoping a going to be um, kind of a, a, you know, a thoughtful, a, a way to start thinking going in this um, exhibition. 
now that no one's touching it and I ended up including a lot of, of the more isolated pieces of it, uh, I, I honestly, I'm still kind of figuring this out. I think even just looking at it now while I'm looking at my screen, I'm, I have a lot of different thoughts. So I, I, I'm not positive, but I am honest. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. So I also want to mention too, a few people have asked the question about if the gallery is open. Uh, so I do want to clarify, um, although we are under orders by the governor to not come in, uh, you can drive up. So we are open 24 hours uh, a day. You can drive right up to the building and look through the window. We have a big open window and you can see the entire exhibition from there. Yeah. Who would have thought drive up art? We have a question from Bill. Uh, it says, your work references both the micro and the macro. Do you tend to prioritize one view while you're creating or installing? I think when I'm working in my studio, it, when I'm working on the individual pieces, they're very much the micro. And then as they get hung on the ceiling and they start being part of a whole, I start seeing more of the macro in that. So I think there's a flip back and forth. That's a great question. We have another question from Adrian. What inspired you to start using a circle loom? And do you build your own? Oh, well, um, so the circle looms came about out of um, necessity in some ways. When I was started with that Athenaeum piece, I didn't have much time and I was the only one I knew how to knit, who knew how to knit, but my friends all kept saying they would help. They would help, but they didn't know how to knit. And so I was thinking about that little spool knitter that um, when I was a little kid, it was four nails in a, in a spool of wood and you made these little chains, you knitted the chains. And I thought, well, what if, you know, what if I made this bigger? And my friend Bill Feeney is an amazing carpenter. And so I, I, you know, was talking to him about it. And he was like, well, yeah, I can build that. So um, we built this card table, cut a hole, got a card table out of Target, put a piece of melamine on top, cut a hole. And then he made the beautiful loom that has 60 pegs that go around it, which I didn't even realize for a while that that also is about marking time. But that's when I realized... Um, that this is something that you can do together. So I put them in my garage and all my friends came over and we had a lot of adult beverages and knitted together and, you know, got the whole show done. But when I started realizing how enjoyable that knitting process was and how meditative it was and how nice it was to look across the table at someone while you're making something. And I talk a lot about how it flattens the hierarchy. There's no, you know, everybody's across from each other, uh, we're all working on the same thing. It's not about ownership of individual things. Everybody's doing it together. I mean, it's very much informed by quilting bees of a long time ago, um, a whole lot of other of the kind of what we call the grandma crafts. But there's such an extreme power in that. And so um, Bill ended up building a whole bunch more for me. And um, the biggest one is out of a five-foot piece of Baltic birch. And I, so it's five feet across, and we have crammed, I think, almost 20 people around that one at one time. So kind of like a dinner table. Thank you so much. We, we have, I'm just going to take a few more questions here uh, so we can close up at eight. So we have about 10 more minutes. Okay. I have a question from Susan. Hi, can you speak a little to your mending projects? I realize it is not part of this exhibit, but it is timely to what is going on now. Thanks. Oh, thanks. Um, yeah, to do a mending project is a collaboration with Siobhan Arnold and Anna O'Kane and myself. And it came about pretty much uh, right after the election. And we were pretty much in the pits of despair, I will say, with the three of us. And we were struggling with, um, you know, not knowing what to do. And we asked each other, you know, what do we know how to do? What, what can we do? And the word mending really had a lot of resonance and we all came from a background of sewing and mending and um, all that kind of textile work. And so uh, through a bunch of different iterations, we came up with uh, 
to do a mending project. And we started out at 1805 Gallery and we just, as people walked by, we had signs up and it was, you know, bring in your clothes, we'll mend them for you. Then we thought about expanding how that could get bigger and everybody knows how to do something. And so mending can be about sharing what you know how to do. I mean, this is super timely right now. Um, and it goes back to a sense of self-sufficiency that you can have because you know how to fix something. You don't, it also can kind of break through capitalism a bit because you don't have to buy another thing. You can fix it. Um, you know, we did everything from Bokashi buckets and all kinds of things. And I think, oh my gosh, we gave folks, you know, some skills that they may be using in these month or so, you know, that we've been home. So, yeah, I think um, mending has been incredibly timely. It was one of those things that we felt, you know, was just really important. And um, yeah, it still is. So I'll, I'll teach you how to mend. If you want to email me, I'll, you know, all of us will, we have a, a Instagram account. You can ask us and we'll try to teach you how to mend things. But it's a good word for right now. Thanks, Michelle. We have another question from an anonymous attendee. Uh, beautiful work, they say. I admire how you utilize used clothing for your beautiful creations. People keep more clothes in their closets than what they really need. What can we do to help? Mm. Well, I, I don't want to sound like a super preacher, but I think the best thing we can do is buy clothes from thrift stores. Um, I think that's probably the thing we could make the most impact right now is just make a vow to yourself. Um, I draw the line at underwear. I buy those new. But other than that, I try to buy almost exclusively from thrift stores. And I think that's a way we can just, it's about breaking a cycle and kind of a mindset too. Um, you know, I think that's, that's a great question though. And, you know, I think we all feel better when we feel like we're doing something, something to help. And, um, you know, that's an empowering place we can come to. Michelle, I've got another question from an anonymous attendee. Without the interactive element, the work holds up as, a, as visual art, so beautiful. Is the overall vertical impression, like trees or stalactites, primarily a conceptual choice or an effect of the practical demands of installation? I think it started as conceptual because there were ways I could deal with the space in other ways than this hanging. Um, so for me, the sense of weight and gravity and sag was very important to kind of break it up from being too sweet. Um, so the, the gravity and the weight of these as they hang is a really important part of my thinking in this. It's, um, yeah, I mean, it, it definitely was something, I mean, I, it is informed by trees, but it adds a, a heaviness that I, I felt was important. Someone asks, do you dye the fabric material or use it in its original form? I do not dye anything. So all the colors are colorful clothing. All the black, I sort all the t-shirts out on my floor in my studio when I get bags of them at the DAV. So yeah, I have not dyed anything in this. It's all the way they came. Um, so that's, yeah. It's, it's also kind of an environmental piece. Sometimes dyeing can be pretty rough on the world. So I, and I have not adept at natural dyeing. So yeah, there's a plaid shirt I'm looking at. There's a lot of blue jeans. Nice close-ups, guys. You're doing a great job. These are some really great uh, works when you look up close. And in fact, I really like this one. I'm going to do a, a little performance with this one because I think I know what it is. Yeah. And this one's good because I don't actually have to touch it. So uh, <laughs> if you hold on for just one second, I'm going to get... Good job. <laughs> oh, that's perfect. <laughs> oh, I love it. Great hair, Andrew. 
I love that. And there's there's a few other ones too. Uh, if we drop the camera just to the left there, that's the one that you were showing in your presentation where you can actually get in and put on. Yeah. And it, you become connected to the the wider environment. I mean, right. I think I was talking to you yesterday or the day before about the connectivity uh, between all of these uh, objects, just like everything is connected in Earth. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. There's lots of strings uh, right now. We're looking at uh, higher up in the gallery, but you can see that everything is sort of connected up above and often things are connected down below. Maybe you could talk about the sort of overall connected structure that we have and how that inspires your work and, and what you're doing. Um, and maybe also why you do that from above instead of from below. Yeah, I mean, it's it's an unusual viewpoint to look up. It kind of is, is a little different and it is has been a bit, uh, you know, a part of my work is changing our viewpoint on things. Also, I think that was really, um, a large part about the book, The Overstory, that really um, affected me about the tree canopy and the way that the trees are connected to each other, not, you know, in, in a root system, but also in up in the overstory area, the canopy up there. Um, it, uh, you know, it's something that also I, I thought maybe that isn't what you first notice when you walk in and then you see that connectivity. I wanted it to, you know, I was hoping it would be this kind of uh, unveiling where you would look at the things that were at eye level and then your eye would go up and say, oh, it's all one organism. And, you know, that's, that's the big, that's, you know, going back to what the person was asking, what's the big picture in this, the big idea. It is that we're all connected in this, you know, we are, the natural world is, um, it's all one, we're all one in there like that. Thank you so much. I have one more question for you. Uh, this question comes from Seatley. And the question is, what is your favorite piece? Oh, that's a really You can also say all of them. Yeah, I know, really. I mean, as I'm holding and touching and thinking, you know, all of these, uh, they, I, have, I remember the time that I made them where I was. So it's, it's like, ask, that's like asking, um, what's my favorite child? You're all my favorite children, by the way. My three daughters are probably listening to me right now. I don't think I can honestly say there's a favorite one. Um, they all have a special place and a special time and a memory about them. And then that they are, my friends and family's clothing um, is, is really special for me too. Thank you. Well, Michelle, I really want to thank you so much for your presentation, for your exhibition. We are very happy to have your work. Again, I do want to thank everyone for joining us in this live streaming exhibition tour. I'm getting the video on me now. <laughs> thank everyone so much for being here. And this is uh, not only live stream, but we're also recording it. So it will show up on YouTube as well as Facebook. Uh, for those who were not able to join us tonight. Again, I want to thank all of our staff uh, and everyone who was involved in putting this together. Um, is my hair messed up from putting on the hat, maybe? <laughs> uh, and I look forward to having you all come visit Lux uh, during this time of, of peacefulness and being in the home. Uh, you can extend your home by coming to visit us here. Uh, in Encinitas. So thank you so much, everyone. And please, uh, I do want to say thank you to all those who donated tonight. All of that helps keep these, pr these programs running, helps keep us going, and we'll have more uh, presentations, live presentations for you in the future, especially over the next few months. So thank you again, and uh, have a good night. Thanks, everybody. Bye-bye. I'm waving, but you can't see me. Oh, except I cut myself out.